and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is my good brother here in the temple, the one and only because we haven't figured out a nickname to stick with him yet, good brother Monarch. I think I am developing tendonitis in my right leg. Yay me. Are we sure you're not a character in from from one of the Final Destination movies? Look, man, I'm just, I'm just breaking down. I think I think that's all it comes down to. Just starting to break down. This is just my life now. You're the same age as me. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, the leg's getting better. I I'm just being bitchy. <laughs> yeah, but we are ba we're back once again with a continued look at Curse Brand Chronicles. Last time around, we covered the base die rolling um, end of things. Now we're get and as well as a little bit of character creation, as far as the outline. Now we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of things. Now, normally I don't cover two or e or even three chapters at once. I know I've been doing that recently with Gods of Metal Ragnarok, which just finished. The reason for that is the chapters we're going to be covering, much like what happened with Ragnarok, are very light. Like if this was a chat, if like say chapter two was like thirty or so pages, that would that would warrant its own episode. But that's not really the case here. Plus, looking over like a lot of the backgrounds. We're not going to be needing to, like, dive too much into each of these. Because mm -hmm. that's getting way deep into the lore that we don't really touch on that much. At least not to that degree. Yep. So, I mean, what what do I look like here? Vati Vidya? Don't answer that. I, I have no idea who that is. He does, he does a lot of lore <laughs> Does a lot of lore videos on um, the Souls games. Especially the. I think I have seen a couple series. of his stuff then. Mm -hmm. Oh, but first we're starting with backgrounds. Opening with, do you hail from the sandblasted deserts, or perhaps you were born in the safety and comfort of the cities? Are you the child of refugees, or did your family come from the protected south? In the world of Curse Brain Chronicles, all characters are more or less human. You'll select your background, which will affect your. Oh. Typo, it says or starting traits. I think it meant to be your starting traits. With few exceptions, any ethnic group can have any nationality. There's no reason a Juren could not be a Drechen citizen. There's no reason a Hassian could not call Imleth home. Humankind comes in all shapes and sizes. Then we have the the base characteristics. Oh, first, ability scores. So your ability scores for all but core are start at 3d8. And I do have to I do believe I have to I have to correct myself. Give me a moment because I think I got the name of that attribute wrong. In my in my def, in my defense um it has been, it has been a few days. <laughs> so Plus, the, plus you have the fact that that um again no bookmarks. Oh, so I, I want to say it. I want to say it was co it was core, but no, actually no, actually no. We did we didn't even get we won't cover that till we get to ability scores. Never mind. Anyway, health <laughs> it, anyway health is stamina plus one d eight per level. Start, starting at level one, durability is ten plus any from background, class, skills, and talents. Vigor is equal to stamina. Again, you can gain additional vigor from class, skills, and talents. Mana is equal to soul, as at the base. Um, size is medium. And then we get. In, in, say, Epic Age, this would be expanded to cover other races, but since Curse Brand is assuming everyone is human, that isn't a factor. <clears throat> but then we have the nationalities, which there are si there are six of. The Drechen Federation, the Hassian Tribes, 
the Imlethi, the City of Sorcerers, the Protectorate Citizen, and the Sagmont Noble. Oh. As well as the Wasteland Refugee, I forgot about that one. And then we have Ethnicities, the Amoni, um, Gaidi, Hassian, Hetian, Juris, Resudan, and Ridian. Each ha each having their own point of origin and the and the like, um, and each be each nationality and be and background does have its own thing in more in more detail, um, because yeah. right next right ne right after that we have the um, protectorate the APOC as we as we've called it the last time we talked about it, and. It does provide for um, background traits. They, um, the passive or passionate temper temperament. You can select any temperament. Although it says it says tent to be when I think it was supposed to be tend. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, you begin with addition health. You begin with additional health equal to your stamina score. Um, identity card. You possess an authentic protectorate identity card, a tiny Manatech device. Sorry, carbonation. That will provide you safe access to the mega cities, the rail network, and many other privileges of the APOC. This also means you have money, double your starting guilders. And then adaptability. You begin because of their adaptability, you begin with one additional skill point. Oh. And we have the Drechen, who get plus t get plus ten durability, plus ten vigor, and have a s if they have a skill bonus to beast handling or riding or survival woodcraft, they get an additional plus one bonus die. Oh, and that's ki that seems to be the pattern that we're s that we're seeing through um, yeah. throughout. The and actual number of background traits are going to vary a little bit. But I imagine there's at least an intent to basically make it so functionally they're all gonna end up equal. Yeah. <laughs> there's about there's the any temperament thing, although there's some temperaments that some backgrounds lean into. And then um for traits. Um for the Hassians, um, they increase their soul score by 1d8, once again, a bit of a typo there. Um, they get plus 10 vigor. They treat high temperatures as one rank lower, so hot is temperate and scorching is hot. <clears throat> and they get to choose one of the following skill lines. Unarmed, knife fighting, or swords. And gain a plus one bonus die to your roll once per turn. The Imlethi... Uh, only get two. Only get two, not two. Three um, background traits aside from temperament. Um, they get an additional one d eight to reason. Oh, uh, and a plus ten. T a plus ten to their starting mana and additional skill point. The Sagmont Aristocrat, on the other hand, gets a lot more because they're. <sighs> They're, if the name didn't give it away, they're the <laughs> setting equivalent of vampires. Yeah, they get more, but some of them are negative. Mm -hmm. I think that marks the only one on this list with any negative background traits. Yep. They get plus 10 mana. They, get, they can either increase their strength f score by 1d4 or their speed or agility by 1d4. Core is for corruption. Mm -hmm. I've just noticed. Yeah. <laughs> um. The during the recovery phase of each round, they recover one point of durability, and during a break or by resting, they'll recover all their durability and one d four points of health. Um. They have a they have a bite attack that does one d six damage. The and. Of course, as a Crimson Noble, geez, I haven't seen that since Wild Arms, 
Um, they have a, they have to drain a pint of blood from a living creature every once every twenty four hours, and you can only drain blood from a willing, helpless, or dying but not dead creature. It takes normal damage from the bite attack, plus an additional one d ten points of damage from the blood loss. So long as you're not starving, you heal the same amount of durability from the creature that is ta that has taken from blood loss. But there is an eff the starving effect. If you go 24 hours without consuming blood, you become starving and cannot recover vigor or health. Drinking a pint of blood ends this effect. After 72 hours, you become desiccated and cannot recover durability. And, of course, light vulnerability. Ultraviolet light burns you for 2d6 points of thermal damage <coughs> per round and causes any light, flammable clothing you're wearing to ignite. Further, abrupt exposure to bright light, such as sunlight, blinds you for one round. On subsequent rounds, you take a one challenge penalty on attack rolls and awareness investigation checks, as long as you remain in the affected area. So, yeah, vampire. Pretty shit. standard vampire shit. Uh, then we have the Wasteland Refugee. Which, ha which only has two features. Um, durability, so they gain plus 15 durability. And Deep Corruption, they increase their initial corruption score by 1d8. And... Yeah, that more or less that more or less covers ba that more or less covers backgrounds. You, the the thing the thing is is that is that even though there's the whole nationality and ethnicity, that's separate from background. I would say background is the closest thing to race in this entry. Yeah. Um. But I think I, I'd have to double check Epic Age, but I think that also has the background and, nation, and nationality thing as well. Yeah. So it is it is one way to spice up the the um, whole fact that everybody's playing as human, except the vampire. Well, <laughs> human or vampire. Two arms, two legs, a head. <laughs> Let me rephrase that: humanoid. <laughs> But then we have yeah. ability scores, and since right. I did a good chunk of talking there, yeah. I will let you take this part. So, all ability scores are generated with a number of dice based on race. Most creatures roll several ordinary dice, D8. But part particularly powerful creep beings, such as eldritch creatures, may roll many poor dice or a few heroic dice. Abilities are ranked from 1 to 100 or more. 11, 15 average. And at 15, every 5 points after, you get a plus 1 heroic bonus dice to action checks that fall under that ability score, as shown below. So it has a chart all the way from 1 to 50. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the 5 through 14 range, which is a 0, it goes up in increments of 5. In many cases, your traits will be derived from your ability scores, such as health and durability. Talents gained via skills and classes may also increase your traits. Critical ability scores. During character creation, when you roll maximum value on one or more of your ability score dice, you roll one additional dice of that same type and add it on. However, you can only gain one critical ability score dice per ability score, even if you roll multiple maximum values on your dice. For example, if you roll 3d8 for an ability score and roll 3, 8, and 8, you roll 1d8 and add it to the total, even though you rolled 8 twice. Ability score increases. There are several ways to increase your scores. If your ability scores are not sufficient when you select your first class, you will raise your ability scores to meet the minimum requirement. As you progress, the most effective way to increase your scores is through spending skill points on talent. Those talents purchased from a skill will often increase your ability scores by an order or be better dice amount. General talents can also increase your ability scores, but by feeble dice. So we've got strength, agility, speed, stamina, 
Empathy. Let's see. This one I'll actually read. Your emotional intelligence, charisma, and strength of personality stem from empathy. You will add your empathy bonus to all manners of interpersonal and creative skills. Few things are derived from your empathy. Memory. Your memory measures your cognitive recall and learning ability. You might add your memory bonus to all kinds of study skills. Your chance to learn new spells and techniques is derived from memory. And we get reason, your ability to solve problems, logic, deduce patterns, etc. Resolve. And then soul. I think I'll read that one too. The scope of your spiritual resilience, eldritch essence, destiny, and intuition. Add soul bonus to your spiritual actions and spell power. Mana is usually derived from your soul score. Usually implies there might be something else, but I'm sure that'll come up later if it is. Using your ability scores. Many traits and characteristics will be derived from your score, but you will also add your ability score bonus when you make a skill or resistance check under that ability score. So with skills, in most cases, you will add one ability score bonus when you use a skill, depending on how you use a skill. For example, if you make an attack with a weapon skill, you will add your agility bonus dice. But if you are attempting to identify the quality of a weapon, you might add your reason bonus instead. In some cases, skills have a default ability score, but not always. And resistance. When you are forced to overcome something affecting your mind or body through raw ability, you make a resistance check. When you are called upon to make a resistance check, the ability you are using is called out. Breaking free of a creature's grasp might call for a resistance check, while seeing through an illusion might call for a reason check. So, then so yeah, oh, that's pretty straightforward. Yep. Oh, this is definitely a get. This is definitely a game for the dice goblin and all of us because a lot because this is clearly rooted more in rolling die than it is in set modifiers. I might actually have a use for all these separate sets of dice I have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but then we have curse brands. At the turn of the century, every culture had legends about people who had become marked by some darkness which would awaken terrible power, and inevitably transform them into fiends. As the first miasma appeared in the aftermath of the war, outcasts, drifters, and social pariahs born with cursed marks discovered they alone had the power to resist the creeping death of the miasma. These damned souls could venture beyond the walls of the Protectorate to fight and protect those within. Still, stigma remained. Regardless of their power, they had the risk of becoming unhinged, dangerous, and mutating far beyond recognition. The curse brands resemble intricate black markings of eldritch lines and interconnecting sigils, usually a few inches across. Sorry, carbonation. While each curse brand is unique, there are seven common formations. Two more artificial formations are known to exist as well. The known curse brands are Beast, one of the most common brands seen often on abominations the beast brand is usually accompanied by physical augmentation and beastly traits crown a rare brand found among the most cosmopolitan and elite this brand is often associated with power influence and dominion maw the hungry brand capable of devouring anything and everything this curse is often found among the poorest and most destitute tempest the brand of rage or elemental of elemental fury and of passion when the Tempest brand appears on a child, it is assumed they will be wild and unpredictable. Thorn, seen most often in rural communities, the Thorn brands is associated with nature's anger, poisons, and the wild dark. Tome, one of the rarest brands that appears in the wild, the brand associated with forbidden knowledge, ancient secrets, and lies. Wraith, commonly found among the wasteland refugees and the most vengeful, this curse brand is ascribed with the power over darkness and malice. Demon, inflicted by junctioning the mysterious Infernal Lens. The Demon brands are the only curse brand received by adults. These brands have rumored, are rumored to grant terrible power at the cost of your free will. And Dragon, this brand is found only among the sand, 
the Sangmont Landgraves, those chosen by the Archduke to receive his gift. Unlike all other brands, unbranded adolescents are selected to become a Landgrave. Look for this class in a future title. <clears throat> then we have Selecting a Curse Brand. <clears throat> the final aspect of your ability scores is selecting your Curse Brand and rolling for your Corruption score. After that, you will increase your Corruption score by spending skill points on your Curse Brand. Each offers extraordinary power, but it also magnifies your corruption and the maledictions you suffer. It is impossible to have more than one curse brand. The only way to prevent your corruption from growing is to ignore these abilities, but the temptation of this power is often hard to resist. So then we have Cost of Corruption. For every five points of your corruption score, you develop a malediction, a curse, or disfigurement. While maledictions might have slightly positive sides to some, they are a detriment and challenge which may rob you of your free will. As your corruption goes, it will become something unique to you. And just and then right after that is developing curse brand. Each curse brand has a series of fixed abilities and several open sigils which you may select from. Those seduced by their dark power who choose to develop their curse brand will find that their corruption score grows with each new ability they unlock, which will inflict further maledictions. And the first one that we have here is the Beast. And obviously I can't show it here, but with each one, and this will be this will be a thing when we get to a lot of the skills, there is a bit of a advancement tree along several tiers. The trees are going to look a little bit different from brand to brand. Yeah. But the general idea is the same, that you have three different paths. Along five tiers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the beast's initial corruption is 2d6. And starts with beast senses, then goes to might, shape, and grace then Open Sigil, w Wicked Claws, and another Open Sigil. Um, then Regen and Beast Hide, and then finally Jaeger form. Now, it, do it does list off what each, of what each effect does. The only one that isn't listed is Open Sigil. Which, let me do a bit of a search. So give it a give it a second while I say so while you're looking that up. I want to say like we came across a oh. something similar to this back in Steel and Steam, where it's you have access to this power, but it's it's going to have some long term consequences if you really want to start tapping into it. Mm -hmm. Whereas that was just kind of one aspect of Steel and Steam. This exists on all of your characters, <laughs> regardless. <coughs> I mean, it it would be kind of a cop out if you did if you yeah. didn't have it, given the given that the game is called <laughs> Curse Brand Chronicles. Yes, but I'm just saying, like, when you get into this game, it doesn't matter what you're playing. That temptation for the power that can burn you is going to be there for every character you make. Mm -hmm. um, That's kind of a core aspect of this game from looking over from how they're describing the curse brands and how they work. Mm -hmm. Now, open sigils are a set, are essentially um, a, a list of freeform um, features that en that any curse mark can take. The catch is, is that anytime you take an open sigil, you increase your corruption by 1d8. I'd s if I were to make an analogy... Do you remember in Anima where where every few levels along magic paths there were free access spells? Yeah. It's kind of like that. There's the there's the features that are tied to the curse brands, and then there's freeform ones that you can take. But now there is a Good variety of the open sigils looking down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's quite there's quite a few, and obviously going through all of them as well as all of the features yeah. is is something is something <laughs> that 
as te it would be tempting to go through, but I think we'd end up getting too far in, in the weeds. Yeah. Um, I will note the crown has a corruption of 1d8, and... I want, I want to see some. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so the, there is a different spread on, as far as how many different abilities each gets. Um, it seems anywhere from 8 to 10. Yeah. But the crown leans leans far more into psychic-like effects. If, any, if anything, some of the curse brands... Oddly enough, remind me of vampire clans, and the and the unique gifts that each of them have. Like the the beast, very much reminds me of Clan Gangrel. Yeah. Um, the crown, Ventru. Now, especially since the, especially since it's all about commanding other people's wills, and well, Ventru's um sim symbol was a scepter. Um. The Maw, uh, maybe Nosferatu, maybe Nosferatu, especially given how the Maw is all is all about, um, essentially draining. Yeah. Now, admittedly, the Tempest, which uh, which um, I sh I should note, the Maw has a corru initial corruption of two d eight, the Tempest has a corruption of one d eight. That's the only. That's the first one that doesn't quite fit the vampire comparison because it is all about um, blasty casty. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's it's a good enough comparison though, mm -hmm. it's just to get an idea for kind of how they work. Even if it doesn't have a direct comparison to vampire, the premise is the same. I mean, the closest I could compare it to the Tempest to say bending because when you start out on that path. On its talents, you have to pick a certain element: um, fire, ice, or lightning. But the the thorn is is leaning heavily into the into the whole nature thing. Um, especially since its first one is essentially. The game's equivalent of bark skin. Um, the tome is do, is doing ma is is a magic themed one, but while there is a magic system, we'll get we'll get into later. The tome is more akin to I'd say a warlock, in the sense of messing with powers they probably shouldn't. Um, the wraith, which has a corruption of two d six instead of a two instead of say two d eight like the tome. Um, I, I guess I could compare it to, um, to like to a legacy of Cain character because it's all about messing around with shadows. Um, the lesser demon is the is the last one, which is described as having a special corruption based on the infernal lens. It's going to be a while before we get to the lenses. And of course, the dragon is is one that can only be selected if you have the Crimson Landgrave class, which we're not getting into classes for this episode. And I don't believe we're going to get Crimson Landgrave either. Those are all the separate book one, I believe. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the time we're recording this, that book isn't out. Um, but then, we, then, of course, there's the whole thing with open sigils, which there's quite a few. And right after that is Maledictions. And Maledictions could be considered mutations. There's a small part of me that kind of wishes that there was a um, table for random Maledictions in this chapter. 
I know some people might say that that sounds a little bit Warhammer-y, but when you're dealing with that kind of price of power, I'd rather leave I'd rather leave that kind of thing in the hands of the GM just to create a bit of chaos so that people don't pick the least problematic uh, malediction. That said, there's 20 of them. It's just a d20 roll and just count it down. It's probably what I'd end, I'd end up doing if I'm ru if I'm running this, but that more or less covers the the um, backgrounds and ability scores part of Curse Brand Chronicles. I think the real state the there's a couple things to really note with with this. One of them is that the when it comes to when it comes to backgrounds, it's it's not doing the ability score modifier that some games might expect. <clears throat> but moreover, is the fact that right right in this particular section, it emphasizes a couple of major concepts. One, dice rules dice rules everything. Oh, in terms of re in terms of resolution, it, a lot of there are some games that will have like a like a little dice and then a bunch of um, static modifiers. Then you have this, which is leaning far more in the um, dice rolling rather than the rather rather than the modifiers. Yeah. I think I think I think what I'm saying is making sense. Oh yeah, the, you're this this game is wanting to roll more and more dice. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is made for the dice goblin. You want to make use of all those dice you've been piling up? Here you go. I'd say a, st a standard die a standard die roll in this kind of thing is going to be like d20 plus one d8 or two or two d8, depending on how well somebody somebody rolled. Because somebody got three, somebody got triple eights on the on their um on one of their ability score rolls. Uh Aside from the fact that that would do, that would do a bit of a um, a bit of an ex, a bit of an explosion, so it might so let's let's say that they get that they get all eights, which so thirty two yeah the 32, theoretical maximum thirty two, which would mean they'd have four bonus dice. So when they're rolling that ability, they'd be rolling d twenty plus four d eight. You know, I'd want to do that even if it wasn't a good ability I was rolling for, just so I could roll for D8. Mm -hmm. And of course, but the bigger thing that came out of the ability of the ability score part of things is the um, way curse brands work. I could and I I could see someone making an argument that curse brands should have been their own chapter. But since it's tied to the corruption ability in this game, I can see putting it in that the ability scores yeah. chapter. Yeah. Uh, it's also it's also an early sign for us about the tree based design of how talents work. And spoiler warning, you're gonna see a lot of that going forward. Like th this particular tree setup with the five tiers. That's going to be standard fare for the for the rest of the setup. I mean, it's going to make it easy to follow along with. Because mm -hmm. once you understand how it works the first time, yeah, it's all just going to keep rolling from there. Mm -hmm. And. When it comes. Of course, just because I said that the open sigil increases um, corruption by one d eight, technically speaking, every single talent f for cursed brands is going to increase your corruption score. Some of them by one d eight, some by one d six, and some like Jaeger form by one d twenty. There is kind of oh Jaeger form it better be worth it. Well, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It t R Jaeger form requires one full turn and twenty mana, but in the aftermath, after the transformation, your strength and speed scores go up by ten, 
and you have access to claw and you have access to claw and bite attacks, an additional action, and a terror rating of of fifteen, and you can maintain it for an hour. So let's attack on Titan Aaron Jaeger. You know what Jaeger means, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know that's not where it comes from. But I, I certainly, I certainly like that it's going with that dice goblin approach because it does mean that somebody can't be one hundred percent certain that they'd be able to make a, a given roll based on their total um, modifiers and the like. I mean, you can have a better, you you can be a little bit more certain, but you can't be absolutely certain that somebody's going to pass or fail a roll. Yeah, definitely adds more variability to your roles, which can make things a little scary when you're dealing with things like permanent corruption. Yeah. So, let me do a little experiment. I'm lo I have any dice loaded up, so let's take that ability score we mentioned earlier and see what range we get for 2d20 plus 3d8. Alright, so it looks like the... The app, the most likely result is going to be is going to be thirty four thirty five with four point nineteen percent. So that's kind of that's kind of where the range is. Whoops, I, I've it did two d twenty by th by three d eight. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the the highest percent. The highest percentage result would be twenty four at four point nine eight percent. And you still you still have a you still have a decent bell curve. So with that with that kind of s but let's but I believe the let me check the um in these in the um v what the average vs might be so let me s so difficult is 25 to 35 so even even though that seems to be even though d20 plus d8 seems to result in higher numbers given given the difficulty ranges we're dealing with it's not as much of an auto win as one might think. Yeah. Plus, you have to depend on the dice gods being on your side, and um, we know that's not happening. Oh no. <laughs> I know some people turn their head, turn up their nose at D twenty because ma bell curve, or th or think that you need to have a more unique dice set. Die setup instead of using d sixes or d twenties, and I'm like, if you're looking at just the die that you're rolling, you're missing the forest for the trees. Oh, it well, d twenty stuck around for a while because it it has its purposes and functions. Well, it's a useful tool. <laughs> well, that and when you when you compare the when you compare the different bell curves, the the difference, the differences there, for tw between individual bell curve setups, aren't statistically significant enough. <clears throat> now, gr now, granted, I'll pr I'll prefer rolling multiple dice inst instead of one because it does provide a little bit of a buffer, and prov and everybody's got that dice goblin in us, even if we want to claim we don't. Out there denies it. I have never met anyone who's denied being a dice goblin. I've seen I've seen some that try that try and that try and claim that they haven't that they have enough dice as it is, and I'm like, don't fucking lie to me. <laughs> we both know you're eyeing that, that next set. You're eye you're eyeing that neck you're eyeing that I see you I see you with those hungry eyes looking at that pewter set of dice. Look, I plan to come back from Houston with at least two more sets of those metal Misty Mountain dice. Mm -hmm. 
I haven't seen what they're offering yet for Matsuri this year. I'm getting at least two sets. Yeah. Now, next time around, we next time around when we when we come at this, we're going to be tackling character classes. And while the game does use character, while the game does use classes, for one, there's there's not that many, and two, the classes are going to be continuing that particular setup that we've seen up until this point of of using um of using a tree setup. I will say that it's going to be a bit more full compared to what you'd seen beforehand. Although, if you're expecting classes to be akin to the classes you'd see in the uh, in more litigious role-playing games, you're not going to be getting that. And I am all the more grateful for that because I would rather I'd rather have classes and class design be married to the particular setting that they're in rather than another generic fighter, for instance. Well, I've t I've talked about how I liked in Fantasy Craft how instead of a fighter you have stuff like soldier, scout, and lancer. Things that might be under the fighter in in other games, but are built for a particular angle within that setup. Because just being good with weapons, it's it's a little too broad. You know, this is this is why you have the basic fighter problem. There is not going to be much of a basic fighter in Curse Brand Chronicles. I can promise that. Even if we only have, let's see, one, two, three. I mean, the existence of the Curse Brand itself kind of prevents that from happening. <laughs> the existence of the Curse Brand, the existence of the lens, the existence of the fact that there are three categories of um of character classes. Um, vocational, ancestral, and augmented. But we'll get into all of that later. <laughs> yeah, it should it should be a, it should be a fun time though. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.